Remember Windows Vista? People used to complain a lot about it back in the day, but I always thought it had style. Everything nowadays is so flat and boring, it all kind of looks the same. But Windows Vista had style. The transparent window bars, the skeuomorphic buttons, it all just had this shiny look to it. And it wasn't just Windows Vista. Mac OS Leopard, iOS 4, PlayStation 3, they all shared this same glossy aesthetic. And a lot of people have been discussing it lately. In fact, it's the latest wave of nostalgia that's been going around. It's called Frutiger Arrow, and if you're a fan of my channel, there's a pretty good chance you're already familiar with it. Now, while Frutiger Arrow is a nostalgic aesthetic that centers around the look of technology from the late 2000s, there's another nostalgic aesthetic called Vaporwave that centers around commercial art and music from the 80s and 90s. Think those old, white disposable cups in grocery store smooth jazz. That's Vaporwave. I've heard the opinion a few times now that Frutiger Arrow is a continuation of Vaporwave, and yeah, I also think so to some degree. But what I think people are missing is that it's not just Vaporwave and Frutiger Arrow. No, these waves of nostalgic aesthetics have been coming and going for longer than you might think. Today we're going to go back in time to trace the interconnected and surprisingly cyclical history of modern nostalgia. Okay, so before we start going decade by decade, I first want to talk a bit about historicism. Historicism is the idea of creating new artistic styles based off of historical art styles. The most common form of historicism you'll find is in architectural revivals, such as the Tudor Revival, Gothic Revival, Baroque Revival, etc. Historicism has been happening in art for hundreds of years, but I don't think historicism is necessarily the same as a nostalgic aesthetic. In my opinion, a nostalgic aesthetic is inherently tied to personal experience, and yeah, I think the architects who designed the British Museum in London were born a couple thousand years late to have personal nostalgia for the times of ancient Greece. Alright, with that out of the way, the first stop on our nostalgic journey is the 1920s. The 1920s was a decade marked by economic prosperity, and it also marked the beginning of many modern things. Radio became widespread in this decade, and the world suddenly became much smaller and more connected than ever before. Cinema was rapidly becoming a cheaper and more stimulating replacement for aging live theater formats, such as vaudeville and music hall. Cars were starting to become mass-produced, and as a result, they became much more affordable for the average consumer. With cars becoming more common, infrastructure started to change. Highways and paved roads were becoming widespread, gas stations and car dealerships were popping up everywhere, and in a lot of ways, the 1920s also marked the beginning of suburban living. Although, that's not to say urbanism wasn't huge in this era either. Skyscrapers were being built taller than ever before to accommodate a quickly expanding urban workforce, with such famous examples as the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building being built in the first two years of the 1930s. There was also major social change in the 20s as well. Women won the right to vote with the suffragette movement, and a sexual revolution was happening as well. Women threw away their corsets and started to wear loose but skimpier dresses that would often reveal their knees and arms. More office jobs also meant more career opportunities for women, and careers allowed them to be more independent than they had ever been in the past. Women started going out to party, they smoked, drank, danced, and wore heavy makeup. Art also underwent a heavy upheaval in this time as well. Avant-garde was in vogue, and the whole idea behind avant-garde was to rebel against traditional styles. In music, the 1920s marked the beginning of jazz, which combined European styles with African styles that were previously seen as degenerate. In 1921, Dr. Henry Van Dyke of Princeton University had this to say about jazz. As I understand it, it is not music at all. It is merely an irritation of the nerves of hearing, a sensual teasing of the strings of physical passion. Its fault lies not in syncopation, for that is a legitimate device when sparingly used, but jazz is an unmitigated cacophony, a combination of disagreeable sounds and complicated discords, a willful ugliness and a deliberate vulgarity. Dr. Henry Van Dyke wasn't the only one to push back against these modern developments. In fact, many people in the 20s and 30s started to look back to the 1890s, or as is more famously known, the gay 90s as the good old days, when things were better. Women were still modestly dressed homemakers who couldn't vote, art and music were still following their traditional evolutions, and the world was less connected and more understandable. In the 1890s as well in the US, there was no income tax. That was a product of the decadent 20s. 
Lots of media in the 20s and 30s idealized the 1890s. The composer Joe Howard started a radio show called The Gay 90s Review, which featured performances from 1890s musical groups as well as stories about the good old days. Many movies were made idealizing the gay 90s as well, such as The Naughty 90s, Bell of the 90s, She Done Him Wrong, and a Mickey Mouse cartoon called The Nifty 90s. In 1924, in New York, a boxer named Bill Hardy opened up an 1890s-themed speakeasy called Bill's Gay 90s, which might be the world's first retro-themed restaurant. The walls were lined with playbills, pictures, and advertisements, all from the 1890s. The idea that one could be nostalgic for everyday things such as playbills and advertisements really marks the beginning of modern nostalgia in my opinion. When you think back to your childhood, you're probably most nostalgic about similar things. Maybe not playbills, but probably advertisements, right? Or maybe a store that doesn't exist anymore. Or a TV show that you used to watch. Common, everyday things. While the 1890s was idealized by the people of the 1920s, the 20s was idealized by the people of the 50s and 60s. There wasn't as much of a political motivation for 20s nostalgia though, it was more just people remembering the fun times they had as kids and passing on these same experiences to their own children. Roaring 20s parties and dances were popular among young people in the 1950s, and there was also quite a few movies idealizing the 20s made in this decade as well, such as Singing in the Rain and Some Like It Hot, just to name a couple. Raccoon coats, which were a staple in the 1920s, also saw a resurgence in the 50s. And if we move on to the 60s, we'll find heavy inspiration from 20s fashion and art in women's clothing. There's a great online exhibition hosted by the New York Fashion Institute of Technology that outlines all the similarities between 20s and 60s fashion. I recommend visiting it if you want to learn more. In the 1960s, people weren't only nostalgic about the 20s. The 60s saw a surge in popularity of counterculture, which started a folk music revival. This revival brought several 1940s and 50s folk musicians such as Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, and Burl Ives back into the limelight. The folk revival also brought along many new artists that were inspired by these older traditional artists, such as Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, and Dave Von Rock. The 60s also saw a very similar revival with blues music. Just like the folk revival, a lot of blues musicians who were active in the 40s and 50s, such as Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker, saw new peaks in their careers. And countless new artists came out inspired by this older blues music like The Rolling Stones and The Animals, just to name a couple. This resurgence of blues in the 60s is probably the biggest wave of nostalgic art there is. I mean like 90% of classic rock from the 60s and 70s were inspired by these blues musicians from the 40s and 50s. And on the topic of classic rock, I want to go on a little tangent to talk about Art Nouveau. It was a style of art that was popular around the turn of the 20th century. It's heavily inspired by nature. It was common for Art Nouveau paintings to include plants and flowers as either a subject or a background. And if there wasn't nature in the painting, it would still have curves and patterns inspired by nature. Art Nouveau would see a resurgence in the late 60s as the art style of choice for the hippie movement. The hippie movement, and psychedelia in general, fit nicely with Art Nouveau because they shared a love of nature and natural patterns. Some concert posters from this era even blatantly ripped off Art Nouveau pieces, stuffing the outlines of these paintings with bright psychedelic colors. The hippie movement was one of the biggest cultural shakeups of the modern era. In just a few years, the old order of popular culture from previous decades fell apart and people began to dress and act very differently. Just compare how celebrities looked in the early 60s to how they looked in the late 60s. Just like in the 20s, this era was one of extreme social change. While we typically associate first wave feminism with the suffragette movement we previously discussed, the 60s brought about the second wave of feminism which was focused on changing the cultural view that a woman's place is in the home. This wave of feminism also coincided with a second sexual revolution as well, which normalized such things as contraception, premarital and casual sex, pornography, and masturbation. The 60s and 70s also marked the height of the civil rights movement as well as the anti-war movement, both of which led to many violent confrontations between police and citizens. It was a tumultuous time, and tumultuous times have a tendency to make people look back at the good old days. In the 1970s, we would start to see nostalgia for the 50s and early 60s, and I think this wave of nostalgia was quite a bit bigger than previous waves. You had countless movies and TV shows that took place in the 50s and 60s, some examples being American Graffiti, Grease, Happy Days, MASH, Laverne and Shirley, The Godfather, Animal House, and if we include the 80s as well, the list expands significantly. You had Back to the Future, Stand By Me, Peggy Sue Got Married, La Bamba, Dirty Dancing, there's really a lot here. 
year. In the 80s as well, we would start to see reboots and remakes of 50s classics. There was a 1985 Twilight Zone reboot, John Carpenter's 1982 remake of The Thing, David Cronenberg's 1985 remake of The Fly, the 1988 version of The Blob, the 1986 version of The Little Shop of Horrors. I could really go on forever. Just like blues and folk in the 60s, we would see nostalgia influencing the music of the 70s and 80s as well. 50s rock and roll stars like Elvis Presley and Chuck Berry would experience career revivals in the 70s, and there was somewhat of a rockabilly revival in the 80s as well. Artists such as the Brian Setzer Orchestra, the Stray Cats, Shaken Stevens, and Chris Isaac would incorporate not only the musical aesthetics, but also the visual aesthetics of rockabilly into their art. The fashion of the 50s and 60s also had a big influence on 80s fashion in particular. Young women would often wear poodle skirts and circle skirts. Men could often be seen wearing letterman jackets and leather jackets with white shirts, much like greasers in the 50s. 50s themed restaurants were also quite popular in the 80s, and that atomic color palette that they often bore became the basis for the neon color palette that defined the 80s. All right, we're about to move on to the 90s, but before we do, I want to talk a bit about the timeline of nostalgia, or rather the idea of a 30-year nostalgia cycle. The theory goes that as people grow into adults, they gain the ability to shape popular culture, and they often shape it around the things they remembered as kids, and this cycle usually lasts 30 years. I'm going to touch on the reasons for nostalgic aesthetics later in this video, but as for the idea of a strict 30-year cycle, I think it's a lot more fluid and complicated than that. We have talked about a couple 30-year cycles, such as 1890s nostalgia in the 20s and 20s nostalgia in the 50s, but we also talked about early 60s nostalgia in the 70s and 50s nostalgia in the 60s. It's messy, and as we get closer and closer to the modern day, it only gets messier. At the end of the 80s, we would start to see another major cultural shift. The 90s did away with the neon colors, and instead brought in much simpler and more muted styles. Grunge music took over as the dominant form of popular music, and it replaced the synthesizers and digital effects that defined the 80s with simpler guitar-driven bands that preferred recording straight to tape, much like in the 1970s. With grunge music came grunge fashion, which popularized thrifting vintage clothes, usually from the 1970s. If you haven't already guessed, 70s nostalgia was a big influence in the 90s. Bell-bottom jeans became fashionable again, and there were also quite a few 70s nostalgia-based movies and TV shows, such as That 70s Show, Dazed and Confused, A Very Brady Movie, and Boogie Nights. Rap music also became very popular in the 90s, and it often sampled funk, soul, and jazz music from the 70s. 70s nostalgia would continue into the new millennium. Many 2000s rock bands would take heavy influence from post-punk or garage rock, such as The Strokes, The White Stripes, The Black Keys, The Killers, The Arctic Monkeys, Interpol, Franz Ferdinand, The National, there's too many to mention. 70s inspired fashion was still popular in the 2000s as well. Just look at how the characters are dressed in Juno or Napoleon Dynamite. But while 70s inspired fashion was popular in the 2000s, so was 60s inspired fashion. Yeah, like I said before, the timeline gets messier as it goes on. There was a mod revival and people started to dress and cut their hair like British mods did in the 60s. There was also boho chic which repopularized hippie fashion for women and that continued into the 2010s. Now that we're in the 2000s, we have to start talking about how the internet influenced nostalgia. While 70s nostalgia was the most prominent form in the 2000s, we would start to see the rumblings of 80s nostalgia coming primarily from the internet. YouTubers like the angry video game nerd and the nostalgia critic would make their names online by talking mainly about 80s media. And on the topic of the angry video game nerd, retro gaming also became popular in the 2000s. I personally remember buying an NES and quite a few games over the last couple years of this decade. Synthwave, which is a music genre that glamorizes the effects-drenched synthesized sound of the 80s, was made popular online by artists such as Kavinsky, who later went on to make the soundtrack for the 2011 movie Drive. And as we reach the end of the 2000s, we would see our first major online nostalgic aesthetic. Before we talk about Vaporwave, let's just quickly go over mainstream nostalgia in the 2010s. The short of it is that 80s nostalgia was prominent, as many of you probably remember. You had shows like Stranger Things and Cobra Kai, Synthwave became mainstream, and you had lots of 80s inspired pop music from artists like The Weeknd and Drake. Alright, with that out of the way, let's talk about Vaporwave. This section of the video will probably be longer than previous sections because Vaporwave is a pretty personal topic for me. 
I was heavily involved in the Vaporwave community. Many of my online friends whom I still speak with today I met through Vaporwave. I even met my fiance through a Vaporwave meme page on Facebook that we both admin. So yeah, Vaporwave is close to my heart for many reasons. It all started with the release of Chuck Person's Eco Jams Volume 1 in 2010. Eco Jams is a Plunderphonics album made up of chopped and screwed 80 samples slowed down and drenched in reverb and delay. The name Chuck Person is just a pseudonym for the artist Oniotrix Point Never, who's made many fantastic progressive electronics albums over the years. He's probably most well known for making the soundtrack to the movie Uncut Gems and for collaborating with The Weeknd on his Dawn FM album. Eco Jams is one of those rare aha moments when an art style comes out almost fully realized. The musical style, the subject matter, even the album art would be the blueprint for Vaporwave going forward. Eco Jams looped sometimes only seconds long pieces of familiar songs and made them sound warped and uncanny, similar to how they might exist decaying in your memory. It's kind of like a pop art version of the disintegration loops by William Bashinsky. A year later in 2011, we would get the second primordial Vaporwave album, Farside Virtual by James Ferraro. While Eco Jams was the blueprint for the plunderphonic side of Vaporwave, Farside Virtual was a blueprint for the composed, non-sampled, digital form of Vaporwave. Ferraro's vision was to make an album that sounded like ringtones. He purposely used simple digital arrangements in a shrill production style intended to be listened to on cell phone speakers. Just a few months after Farside Virtual at the end of 2011, we would get what's probably the most famous Vaporwave album, Floral Shop by Macintosh Plus. Floral Shop took inspiration from the plunder phonics of Eco Jams, but made it less harsh sounding and more approachable. The smooth sounds paired with the striking album art made for what would become a cult classic a couple years later in 2013, when Vaporwave truly took off. This is when I got into Vaporwave. I just graduated high school and was experiencing my first taste of the freedoms and responsibilities of college and adult life. I got my first car and me and my friends would drive around at night listening to Unknown Death 2002 by Young Lean or paid programming by Bones. We would go to Denny's at 3am or we would just park somewhere and talk about the latest gossip and our plans for the future. I was in a band at the time, but I started experimenting making Vaporwave beats, although I never uploaded them anywhere because they weren't very good. On the topic of beats, Vaporwave had a big influence on internet rap at the time. I already mentioned Young Lean and Bones, who were both extremely popular in the Vaporwave community. There was also Viper the Rapper, who's most well known for his song, Y'all Cowards Don't Even Smoke Crack. Viper is unintentionally Vaporwave sounding, but he was still popular in the Vaporwave community nonetheless. But back to 2013, it was around this time when I got into the Vaporwave meme community, which was a huge part of Vaporwave culture. There were many meme pages that would share nostalgic pictures recalled from fuzzy memories of the late 90s and early 2000s. The pictures shared on these pages accomplished a similar goal to Vaporwave music. They both presented you with either a memory or something that feels like a memory. That's not to say these pages weren't about memes as well though, no, memes and funny pictures were the driving force of this community, but even the memes tended to stay on the topic of Vaporwave and nostalgia in general. Vaporwave art was also quite popular in this time. People would combine neon colors with old Windows or Mac screenshots, Roman busts, and Japanese stuff. Yeah, Japanese stuff in anime is a big part of Vaporwave. I've never really understood it personally, but that's how it was. Vaporwave would continue to gain popularity and evolve as the 2010s went on. Many subgenres of Vaporwave music were created, such as Mallsoft, which focuses on Muzak you might hear in a grocery store or mall. There was Dream Punk, which is basically Vaporwave ambient music. And there was also Signal Wave, or Broken Transmission, which is about looping extremely short snippets of commercials or broadcasts. I've made a couple Signal Wave albums myself. I'll put a link to my Bandcamp in the description. Vaporwave music is still being made and developed, and new subgenres like Hex D are still popping up to this day. But unfortunately, the Vaporwave meme community is pretty much dead, with the exception of only a couple pages that still post. But while the Vaporwave meme community might be dead, I do think the spirit of these pages still live on in Weirdcore, Kidcore, and Liminal Space Instagram accounts. There's a very similar coming of age nostalgic tint to them, and looking at these accounts you can see the formation of communities similar to the Vaporwave meme community that me and my friends were a part of. Vaporwave is a huge topic. I covered a few things, but there's a lot I had to leave out like crappy Redbubble shirts and Seinfeld. 
Yeah, we gotta move on. It's time to talk more about Frutiger Arrow. Have you ever heard of the Consumer Aesthetics Research Institute? Yeah, me neither. They're an online foundation made up of researchers and designers whose mission it is to categorize every consumer aesthetic into a public database. A lot of the stuff we've talked about in this video is actually listed in this database. In 2017, a member of this institute named Sophie Lee would coin the term Fertiger Arrow. Fertiger coming from the Fertiger font and Arrow coming from Windows Arrow, which if you don't remember was the main theme of Windows Vista. Lee coined the term to describe the glossy, lifelike look of technology in this time period, with a focus specifically on Windows Vista. But where did this look come from? In 2006 and 2007, the internet was on the precipice of exploding. The iPhone was unveiled, Facebook had expanded past college-only accounts, Google bought YouTube, Twitter was created, and more people than ever before were logging onto the internet. In 2007 alone, global internet usage had grown by 61%. With all these new people regularly using computers for the first time, tech companies needed a design language that was approachable, friendly, and most importantly, easy to figure out. Enter Frutiger Arrow. Real life representations of objects and interactive parts of the user interface made it easy for newcomers to instinctively know what an element was intended for. Buttons often had depth and often a glossy sheen as well. The term for all of this is called skeuomorphism, and it's actually made a bit of a comeback in the last couple of years as neomorphism, which accomplishes similar goals but in a much more subtle way. That glossy sheen wasn't just for people to know if an element was a button or not, it was also part of an overall effort to make user interfaces feel friendly. Only 7 years prior you had the sharp, grey, and frankly lifeless user interface of Windows 2000. Frutiger Arrow sought to turn these old ideas on their head and make UIs feel fun and natural. And by natural, I don't just mean intuitive, I also mean nature. Frutiger Arrow is full of references to nature and water. Bubbles are a common theme and so are grassy meadows. Green and blue are probably the most prominent colors in Frutiger Arrow. Is it possible that tech companies wanted user interfaces to feel more like the outdoors in a time when we were taking the internet outside our houses for the first time in the form of smartphones? It wasn't just technology that used Frutiger Arrow designs, however. If you go on the Frutiger Arrow subreddit, you'll find people posting pictures of soap dispensers, shampoo bottles, drinks, and also gum. Though, I don't think any of those were inspired by Frutiger Arrow or vice versa, I just think that these products as well as technology at the time were both trying to represent the same things. Clean, fresh, and friendly. And speaking of friendliness, is it also possible that in the uncertain and volatile times we live in today, a friendly design language such as Frutiger Arrow feels more appropriate than modern design? Let's not forget that Frutiger Arrow came about during the Great Recession, another time of uncertainty. I do think it's a lot more than just friendliness that attracts people to Frutiger Arrow though. If we think about all the features of Frutiger Arrow, friendliness, approachability, ease of use, nature, then what exactly does the Aurora have to do with any of that? Yeah, the Aurora was everywhere in Frutiger Arrow, not just in Windows Vista, but in many other places as well. It didn't really make the user experience any easier, friendlier, or more approachable. It just kind of looked cool, right? And I think more than friendliness, that's what's missing from the design language of today. You see, when Frutiger Arrow was around, there wasn't nearly as many accepted design standards for technology as there is now. In a lot of ways, it was the wild west. Companies could pretty much do whatever they wanted because people didn't have an expectation of any particular design when using technology. This chaos led to many questionable design decisions, remember the Pono? It also led to companies experimenting a lot more than they do today, and as a result, using designs that are just meant to look cool. With all the accepted standards for design languages nowadays, everything just kind of looks the same. It's boring, flat, and lifeless. A lot like Windows 2000. I think Frutiger Arrow being so popular nowadays is a good sign that design language standards are going to move away from flat metro styles back to skeuomorphism. But don't expect any more bald experiments, that's probably gone forever. My favorite personal memory of Frutiger Arrow is probably the Wii U. I remember the whole time I owned it thinking how cool and slick the operating system looked. Everything was shiny and glossy and it was fun, it just had so much life to it. 
You'd have the menu on the gamepad, and then on the TV, you'd have all the Miis from your console as well as other consoles, along with random updates from the Miiverse. The Switch UI in comparison looks bland and dead, and I can't say I've ever been wowed by its UI the same way I was by the Wii U. <laughs> the Wii U. That's nostalgic. We got derailed from nostalgia for a bit there, didn't we? But I guess we're also done our nostalgic journey, we've reached the current day. I mean, we could talk about people on TikTok buying iPhone 3GSs for the vibe, but why don't we try to analyze some of what we just went through instead? The first thing I want to point out are the similarities between the 1890s and the 1950s. Both decades are looked back upon as a peak of society before great social change, and the times of great social change that followed these decades, the 1920s and the 1960s, are even more similar. Both decades had a sexual revolution and major feminist movements. In the 1920s, alcohol was illegally consumed in an underground market. In the 1960s, the same thing happened with marijuana and psychedelics. Jazz in the 20s was seen as a degenerate danger to polite society the same way rock music was in the 1960s. And some of the biggest similarities between these two decades are seen in fashion. There's a question that's been bugging me. Why did this kind of nostalgia only start in the 1920s? I'm sure you can find minor examples of people being nostalgic for times before, but it seems the 1890s were the first decade people were truly nostalgic for. Why is that? 
I think to answer this question, we should take a look at where the word nostalgia comes from. In 1688, a Swiss doctor named Johannes Hofer had been researching the psychological afflictions of soldiers fighting in foreign countries for his medical dissertation. These soldiers had depression, weakened immune systems, and even fevers. He coined the word nostalgia to describe what these soldiers were dealing with. The word comes from two Greek words, nostos, which means to come home, and algos, which means grief or pain. Nostalgia. Homesickness. Nostalgia was originally seen as a mental illness, and Hofer's theory was that these soldiers were pining so badly for their homelands that it was affecting their will to live. While it's more than possible the soldiers he studied actually had PTSD, the word nostalgia would stick around in the medical lexicon for the next couple hundred years. Sir Joseph Banks, a member of the Cook Expedition to Australia and New Zealand, wrote in 1770 that the sailors on his ship were suffering from an intense nostalgia. Homesickness. In the late 1800s, the idea of nostalgia as a literal homesickness would fall out of fashion, and only a few decades later, we would get the modern idea of nostalgia as we know it today. But what was the catalyst for this transition? I have a couple theories. My first theory concerns the Industrial Revolution, which made the world change more rapidly than it ever had previously. Before the Industrial Revolution, it was common for culture and life to be more or less the same between when you were born and when you died. But after the Industrial Revolution, life would be extremely different only 10 or 20 years apart. Just look at how different 1959 is to 1979. In the 1600s, Hofer would send troops home to treat their nostalgia, and he wrote that this was a reliable method of treating the condition. But it's not as simple for nostalgia nowadays, because you're homesick for a world that no longer exists. Now, that statement is a little exaggerated. The world in 2023 isn't exactly a different planet than it was in 2001, which is probably also why nostalgia is no longer a medical condition, but rather it's more of a feeling or a longing. My second theory involves the idea of pop culture. Before the late 1800s, pop culture simply didn't exist. There was only high culture, or official culture, which was the culture of the upper classes. The spread of culture is linked to connections between people and the ability to express yourself through art or writing. Before the 1800s, it was mainly the upper classes who could afford to travel and had the ability to read or write. But after the Industrial Revolution, the masses became more educated and they suddenly had railroads connecting them. And, as a result, an organic popular culture arose. It also helped that manufacturing ability skyrocketed during this time, and suddenly people across entire countries had the ability to buy the exact same products, whereas before most things were only produced and sold locally. I don't think it's a coincidence that nostalgia only seems to get stronger as people become more and more connected. In our journey through the last century of nostalgia, it only seemed to grow as time went on, and new technologies connecting people were developed. In the age of the internet, nostalgia is the strongest and most prevalent it's ever been, as we're also the most connected we've ever been. Just look at how many people complain about how everything is a remake or a reboot nowadays. There's a reason why familiar things from our childhood sell so well. We have a longing for it. We're homesick. The world is changing fast. There's a famous quote I want to read to you. Children. They have bad manners, contempt for authority, they show disrespect for their elders, and they prefer talking instead of learning. They no longer stand up when their elders enter the room, they contradict their parents and show no respect to their teachers. Children nowadays are tyrants. This is a quote by Socrates who died more than 2400 years ago. Us humans have always been looking back, it's just nowadays we have so much to look back upon. And the past can be fun to think about because it's absolute, there are no possibilities. We know exactly what's going to happen and when it happens. I think there's a sense of comfort to that kind of certainty. I want to ask you a favor. Wherever you are, whenever you're watching this, I just want you to really take in your surroundings. Smell the air, hear the sounds, analyze every little thing you can because you might not be thinking about it now, but one day you're going to be nostalgic for this part of your life, maybe even for this moment. So instead of looking back, take a second to absorb the present. And thanks for watching.